Welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis, and today I'm going to take a deep dive on one of my all-time favorite bands. One of the bands that were instrumental in the creation of post-punk and goth. I'm talking about Susie and the Banshees. Alright, so I chose to focus on Susie and the Banshees because in just four days, September 20th, it will be 44 years since the Banshees played their very first gig. That gig was at the 100 Club, which was at 100 Oxford Street. It was a two-day punk festival headlined by the Sex Pistols, The Clash, and Subway Sect. And then low on the bill was Susie with a Z and the Banshees. And the Banshees at that point were Steve Severin, her partner in crime on bass, and Marco Peroni on guitar. Marco would later play with Adam and the Ants and a very young Sid Vicious on drums. They played only a few songs, one of which was The Lord's Prayer set to music. So it was somewhat of an inauspicious beginning for a band that would have one of the most influential and creative careers in music. The Banshees formed out of a small group of friends that would hang around the Sex Pistols. They were known as the Bromley Contingent. Anyway, Susie Sue and Steve Severin began gigging with different people. Before long, they settled on drummer Kenny Morris and self-taught guitarist John McKay. The band built up a great live reputation. Their reputation was further enhanced by a stellar John Peel session in which they tore through their early live set. On August 18th of 1978, the band put out Hong Kong Garden, one of the best singles that the punk scene ever produced. It features super inventive guitar work from John McKay, and even though the band is very young, it's one of Susie's finest vocal performances. In November of 1978, the band put out their debut album, The Scream. This album is just transcendent. Few albums can claim that they gave birth to post-punk. This is one of them. This album is opened by a very strange track, Pure. It's pretty much an introduction to the fact that what you're about to hear on the rest of this album is otherworldly. Jigsaw Feeling properly starts the album. Send me forward, say my feelings, but all the signals leave me reeling. Jigsaw feeling right there. This is music for people sitting alone in their bedroom crying while it's raining. And we all do that. I'm tearing up just talking about it. Overground has a guitar riff that is very unconventional and it's incessant and haunting. It will stay with you. A lot of the songs on here stay with you. Carcass is as bloody and harrowing a track as anything Guar put out. There's a cover of the Beatles' Helter Skelter on here and right from the beginning, they let you know that they're not afraid to do cover songs, and they make it their own. Their version is so unique and off-kilter that it almost makes the Beatles version sound tame by comparison. Metal Postcard is a relentless and methodical drone that will be stuck in your head for weeks afterwards. It's the kind of song that armies of the dead should march to, or just armies. Nicotine Stain is one of my favorite tracks on the album, and it is probably their most straight-up punk song on the album. Susie set the vocal template here for what she would do successfully on other albums, but she would only grow from here. This is primal Susie. She almost has a feline quality on this album, a feral feline quality. She will not be tamed. There's a lot of anger here. There's a lot of grit. The album ends with Switch, another great song. There's no let up on this album. It is just one great song after another. And it's one hell of a debut statement by a band. When you're sick and tired, of songs trying to cheer you up. Throw this bad boy on there. It is music for people who hate most music. In September of 1979, the band release, Join Hands. This is the UK pressing. It has a beautiful label with the flowers on it, commemorating Poppy Day, which is one of the tracks on the album. Poppy Day is the first track. It's another mood setting intro to let you know that something wicked this way comes. Whereas the debut album's first track, Pure, was more of a sound collage, Poppy Day is an actual song and a nifty little number. Regal Zone was our first hint that this band was already surpassing post-punk and moving on to goth. Placebo Effect, Icon, and Premature Burial continue the goth vibe with some of the band's most dark, foreboding lyrics. You'll ever hear. Put away the razor blades. Playground Twist was the single release from the album, and John McKay plays saxophone on that, and it's one of Susie Sue's best vocal performances. It's got a childlike sing-song equality at the same time as it's edgy and dark. Mother is the kind of song that sounds like it should play in a creepy horror movie, 
when one of the characters opens up a music box that they shouldn't. I'm never going to get to see a merman. The LP ends with a version of the Lord's Prayer, which was one of the songs I mentioned they played at their very first gig. It has evolved since then, and it is highly listenable here. I guarantee you it was not as good at their first gig. This was the last album to feature Kenny Morris on drums and John McKay on guitar. The band had a big blowout argument, and Kenny and John ended up quitting on the very day this album was released. Ordinarily, that would spell doom for a band, but Susie and Steve would prove to be very, very lucky time and time again with replacing band members. In order to tour this album, they got in Budgie on drums. He's a virtuoso drummer, one of the best drummers out there on the scene, then or now. And as a guitarist, they grabbed Robert Smith, who Susie and Steve had become friendly with after they played gigs together all the previous year. By the way, John McKay and Kenny Morris seemingly dropped off the face of the earth. For anyone as talented as each of those guys, to not have high profile projects after these two albums, it's inexplicable. I'm gonna go on a Dog the Bounty Hunter-like quest to find these guys. Are they dead? So the end of Susie and the Banshees Mark I gave birth to Susie and the Banshees Mark II with 1980's Kaleidoscope. This was released in August of 1980. Budgie is now a permanent member of the band. Susie Sue, Steve Severin, and Budgie, their picture is on the front of the album, and it's also on the inner sleeve. And Robert Smith was busy with his band The Cure, so they ended up getting a new permanent member in the form of John McGeoch. John McGeoch had already played with Magazine, and his guitar work with them it set a new standard for what was possible in post-punk. You should think of John McGeoch as a sort of post-punk Jimmy Page. He plays with a soulful virtuosity. He's one of the most underrated guitarists of all time. He's never gotten his due for what he's given to the new music made during the post-punk period. I don't want my praise of McGeoch to overshadow Budgie, who is one of the most versatile drummers ever. He played, of course, on the Slits album Cut. Very few drummers could have done the job he did on Cut. Before there was Stephen Perkins, there was Budgie. Heavy tribal rhythms never sounded so delicate. Budgie's deft touch is only exceeded by his unerring sense of rhythm. He drives this band from this album on. By the way, Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols, aka Jonesy from Jonesy's Jukebox, plays guitar on three tracks on this album. Clock Face, Paradise Place, and Skin. Happy House is the first track that opens this album. It's the first single from the album, and it is wholly unlike anything that came before it. That is the beauty of what Budgie and John McGeoch brought to the table. The track is totally modern, yet there's a psychedelic touch to it. It totally sets up the kaleidoscope, if you will, of different colors you're going to experience on this album. Tenant is moody and atmospheric. The music paints a beautiful, terrifying picture. Trophy is one of my favorite deep cuts, and it sees all four band members blending together as if they played together for years. Hybrid is another underknown gem propelled by Budgie's drumming, and McGeoch even plays a little saxophone on it too. This album saw the band place one foot firmly in New Wave. Just when you think they put post-punk to bed and are onto more experimental things, they hit you with clock face and remind you that this is the band that did Nicotine Stain. Lunar Camel is a sensuous synth track whose beauty totally grabs you by surprise. Christine, the second single from the album, it came out in May of 1980, is perhaps the most uplifting downbeat song ever. It's all chiming guitar and danceable beat. It's a song about Christine Sizemore, whose story inspired the movie Three Faces of Eve. She suffered multiple personality disorder. She had 22 distinct personalities, and the song's lyrics give the album its title. Christine is the prettiest song on the album. It's one of their all-time greatest songs. I can't even explain to you how I felt the first time I heard that song on the radio. Same thing for Hong Kong Garden. You can't believe a song like that exists until you hear it, and then you have to hear it a million times. You will never get sick of hearing Christine. The track Red Light is one of my all-time favorite Susie and the Banshee songs. It's a dose of morbid, gloomy electronica that manages to be sexy and scary at the same time. The track Skin closes the album, and it is a frenetic attack on the fur industry. This was years before Meet is Murder. All in all, it's a beautiful, varied album that wasn't a continuation of what they had been doing, but rather a big first step into a much larger sonic landscape. I love this album. When I had one and I played it to death and wore it out, I had to get another one. And if this wears out, I'll get another one. 
it is one of my two favorite Susie and the Banshees albums. Speaking of which, June of 1981 brought Juju. This is some good Juju. As I said, it's one of my two favorite Susie and the Banshees albums. I can't tell. They keep jockeying for position, which is my favorite at any moment. But this is a perfect album. It opens with Spellbound, which is perhaps John McGeoch's greatest guitar work. And that is saying something. From beginning to end, this album is a tasty goth sandwich. Into the Light is a rhythmically complex track, yet at the same time it sounds so simple and sweet and easy on the ears. Arabian Nights is a top five Susie and the Banshees track for me. It's epic and cinematic, yet its chorus is so pretty that it grounds the entire song and makes you forget that you're hearing lyrics like Veiled Behind Screens, kept as your baby machine, whilst you conquer more orifices of goats, boys, and things. Let that sink in. Yeah, that's a love song. Those are lyrics, my friend. Halloween and Monitor and Night Shift are three of the greatest goth songs ever recorded. With the perfect mix of dark imagery and colorful arrangements, Monitor in particular has an almost industrial edge to it that shows you just how heavy Susie and the Banshees could get if they wanted to. And Halloween, how has Halloween never been used in a Tim Burton film? Seems like a natural. It ends with the track Voodoo Dolly, which is seven minutes of deconstructed goth weirdness. Voodoo Dolly is kind of to Juju what LA Blues was to Funhouse. It's the only way this album could end. This beautiful, tragic, clattering collection of songs just sort of slows down and dies. This is a gloomy, irresistible, beautiful bruiser of an album. 1982 brought A Kiss in the Dream House. It starts off with Cascade, and yet again for Susie and the Banshees, the first track perfectly sets the table for the tone of the album to come. Lush, romantic, tragic, and beautiful. The track Obsession combines the best elements of torch songs and murder ballads. She's a Carnival. Sounds like it could have been on Juju. The layered rhythms are balanced perfectly with Susie's double-tracked vocals and the result. The song Melt is, in my humble opinion, their greatest ballad. It chronicles romance, as only Susie and the Banshees can, in lace and blood and sperm. Hey, you're going to want to look up those lyrics. Painted Bird is one of my favorite tracks off the album. It's an up-tempo number to which Susie does some of her finest dancing when you see them live. Slow Dive was the first single off the album. It's an irresistible track. It's heavily rhythm-based. There are strings on it that would scare even Bernard Herrmann. John McGeoch is doing all sorts of interesting things that I can't even put my finger on. This whole album blends goth with neo-psychedelia, and the results are stunning. This breathtaking album was John McGeoch's last with the band. He suffered a nervous breakdown. He collapsed on stage, actually, when they were in, I believe, Madrid and he had to be replaced. So this ends the classic Mark II era of Susie and the Banshees. So Susie and the Banshees didn't just lose a guitarist, they lost one of the best guitarists on the scene. They also had quite a lot of dates left on their tour. So in stepped their old buddy, Robert Smith of The Cure. This live album captures his time with them. This was his second stint with the band. These are live versions of most of the songs from Juju and A Kiss in the Dream House. In retrospect, this album plays like a greatest hits. Robert Smith brought a lot to the table. He found new and interesting ways to interpret John McGeoch's material. And he also played a lot of keyboards on this album that took the arrangements of songs in new directions. So this is a very interesting album for many, many reasons, if you're curious about this era of Susie and the Banshees. And I highly recommend you check it out. It's a double album, so there's plenty of tracks here for you to fall in love with. In June of 1984, the band released Hyena. This is the only studio album on which Robert Smith is a full member of the band. Robert was on hiatus from The Cure. The band had just released the very harrowing album Pornography, and his bass player Simon Gallup had just quit. So Robert very much needed a change of pace, and he was happy to join the Banshees. So Robert Smith is here. On some tracks, he's very inventive and very much in the forefront, but on most of the tracks, He's sort of happy to blend in and to find his place. The real star on the album is Budgie. He drives this entire album. Most of the songs start out with him. Budgie is to drums what John McGeoch was to guitar. The opening track, Dazzle, uses actual orchestral players 
and finally gives Susie and Steve that orchestral sound they have been trying to create with rock instruments for years. Take Me Back sees the band at their jazziest and proves that they were absolutely fearless about following their muse wherever it leads. The same cannot be said for a lot of their contemporaries on the post-punk scene who were too busy looking cool rather than pushing post-punk and goth boundaries. Swimming Horses, one of the two singles off the album, is a brilliant track. It's one of the best songs they've ever done. Budgie's drumming is exceptional on that. Robert Smith is at his most prominent not on guitar, but on piano. Smith would later use a very similar piano part for his song Six Different Ways on Head on the Door. This song is a heavy hitter on this album, and it's a high water mark for the band creatively. Bring Me the Head of the Preacher Man is a great track. It's very much almost like Ennio Morricone meets the Velvet Underground. A cover of the Beatles track Dear Prudence is on this album. Because this is the North American version, it was not on the original British version. It was a single, made it all the way to number three on the pop charts, but they were kept off the top slot by Karma Chameleon. So much for It Comes and Goes. The track Running Town also has more Robert Smith piano goodness. Oddly enough, Robert Smith makes his presence most felt on piano rather than guitar. On one track, however, Robert Smith totally kills it on guitar. It's called Blow the House Down. It's his finest guitar work on the album, and reportedly Robert said that playing it live actually makes his fingers bleed. That's all I expect from a band. Now you're talking goth. Robert, of course, had to go back to The Cure, so they recruited a new guitarist, John Valentine Carruthers. He was good friends with John McGeoch. He was in the band Clock DVA, and in April 1986, this new lineup put out Tinderbox, a fitting name for a smoker of an album. Candyman is a fantastic track with tons of emotion and energy. Sweetest Chill may be the most underrated track on this album. It is a favorite, it's a deep cut, and it is a beautiful song, and I implore you to check it out. This Unrest is a long, dark track for any goth kid who mistakenly believes that the band had left him behind and went pop. The track Cities and Dust, oh my god. What an amazing song. It was released in October of 1985 as a single before the album dropped, and it is one of their finest songs. It's, believe it or not, a dance song about Pompeii. The band pull off a masterful tightrope act because somehow it's very, very commercial sounding without selling out their signature sound. I don't know how they did it. You probably already know Cities and Dust. If you do not, you must, must, must hear it right now. The song Parties Fall is another hidden gem. The music shimmers as the lyrics brood. Susie's voice was seldom as pretty. It's a beautifully dour masterpiece. 92 Degrees is another stunner. Susie's vocals carry this album. The track Land's End is the perfect way to put this album to bed or to tuck you into your coffin. Budgie's drumming is inventive and Steve's bass playing drives the song. This is another stunner of an album. The band drop their Bowie pinups. It is a collection of cover songs. They do wonderful renditions of most of them. They cover a lot of songs that were influential to them. They love Sparks, This Town Ain't Big Enough for the Both of Us, and they do a very, very fun version of it. They cover Iggy Pop's The Passenger. I am a big fan of that cover. I used to spin it every time I would DJ, and people would always come up and be like, what the hell is this? Where is this from? In a good way. This Wheels on Fire by the band, another great version of another great song. They cover Gun by John Cale and make it their own and imbue that song with a seductiveness that is lacking in the original. They do Little Johnny Jewel by television. They do a version of Strange Fruit, which was made famous originally by Lady Day. It is sadly still very apt today. If you've not heard their version of Strange Fruit, I implore you to listen to it because it's so heartfelt and so serious. This is not a filler album. This is another strong album. September of 1988 saw the band drop Peekaboo. This was a very successful album for them and allowed them to cross over into America in a bigger way than they had before. This album means a lot to me because I actually saw them on this tour at Radio City Music Hall, 1988. To this day, it is the best looking audience I've ever seen in my life. It was a gorgeous line snaking its way up and down 6th Avenue, waiting to get in. It was a sea of Susies. Can you imagine such a thing? And I'm not talking they all tried to look like one era of Susie. There were different eras of Susie waiting on that line. Beautiful women everywhere. How much did I love that concert? 
I still have the ticket. Look at the price on that. Can you believe what you used to get for that money? They put on such a great show. Susie had a new Louise Brooks kind of bob hairstyle. Adorable. She had a new dance move too. A lot of swinging arms when she danced side to side. It was uh, the flashbacks. This is a great album. Lots of great moods and textures. They kept some of the dance element, but they didn't sacrifice any of their edge. They released a couple of singles from it. One was Peekaboo, which took over the planet. This shot up to number one. If someone only likes pop music and they're like, I don't know if I'll like Susie and the Banshees, you play them Peekaboo. They'll like it. And on the back, you can cut out a mask, put some string through it, and you can wear it. No one ever did that. That didn't stop them from designing this. This was single number one. Single number two was The Killing Jar. And this only went to number two, so it couldn't quite outshine Peekaboo. The Killing Jar might be my favorite track on the album. It is a perfect song. It blends old Susie and the Banshees with new Susie and the Banshees effortlessly. The song Scarecrow is good on this, Carousel. It's a very strong album, but I want to point out the last beat of my heart. It is a slow burn of a track. The last beat of my heart shows that their goth heart was still beating strongly. Very big fan of this album. Susie and the Banshees don't have any weak albums, but these were the eras of the band that I wanted to focus on, the eras of the band that spoke to me personally, which is a lot more Susie and the Banshees and not quite as much Susie solo, which I kind of take the last two Susie and the Banshees albums to be. Finally, if you want to fall in love with Susie and the Banshees, the best way to do it is probably the original way a lot of people did it, and that's with Once Upon a Time, the singles collection. Hong Kong Garden, Happy House, Christine, Spellbound, they're all here. This is a fantastic compilation that will never be improved upon. All of the early great Susie stuff is here. It's a great toe-in-the-water album, but it's also great for completists after you get all of these studio albums. So I highly recommend this. That's it for this week of Pop Culture Graveyard. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive on Susie and the Banshees. If you liked this episode, please hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you next week with some more cool stuff.